Matthew 18, verses 23 through 35. And the word of the Lord today from the King James. I always preach from the King James text. Reads in this fashion. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, listen, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest, thou, shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, or the torturers, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Amen. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, the sacred text has been opened. The Word of God has been read, and now it is incumbent upon me, your servant, called to fill the sacred desk, called to impart the Word of God to the people of God. Now, God, it's on me. Lord, I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I know and I understand today, God, how important a message this is. And oftentimes we hear certain messages, Lord, and we feel that their import is less than perhaps that which we ought to assign to it, but Master, today we cannot afford to take this message lightly. Help me to deliver it with power, with divine authority and love that the people of God might receive and benefit from it. Master, today let the Word of God today be that seed which finds its way to the heart and let the heart today, God, be good ground. Ground that is broken up, prepared to receive the Word of God with gladness that it might spring forth unto life and life eternal in our soul. Help us to live what we're about to hear and not merely to receive it in our hearing. Anoint the ear of every hearer 
For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I've titled my message today, Believers, Vitamin C. There is a vitamin that is essential to the life of human beings. And sometimes, you know, we don't really realize just how important a role certain ingredients and certain things play in the life of a human being. But there is one vitamin that is so important and so essential to healthy living and to long-term survival, and that is the vitamin C. Vitamin C is described as an essential micronutrient that plays a part in numerous vital processes within our body. There are 13 different things that vitamin C affects within the human body. First of all, it influences the growth and repair of body tissues and helps with wound healing. Many of us don't realize that, do we? Secondly, when we're familiar with this, it boosts our immune response. Thirdly, it improves our moods and mental health. I never knew that before researching this message. Number four, it acts as an antioxidant and fights oxidative damage. That means that it actually works against the development of cancers. Number five, it supports and regenerates vitamin E. Now, that's something that I didn't know. I'm not a doctor. I didn't realize that one vitamin could have a positive impact on another vitamin. But as vitamin E processes in our body, it changes and it no longer offers us the benefits it offered us initially, but what vitamin C does, vitamin C transfers it back to its original state, more or less, so that now we can experience the benefit of it again. And that process just keeps going on and on. So vitamin E winds up surviving in our body and benefiting us much longer because of the presence of vitamin C. Number six, many of us are familiar with the fact that it prevents scurvy from developing. Number seven, vitamin C increases calcium absorption and boosts bone health. Number eight, it improves the health of our skin. Number nine, it helps to mitigate the damage from smoking. Number 10, it enhances the absorption of non-heme iron. 11, it may help to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. Number 12, it may help with macular degeneration and lowers the risk of cataracts. Number 13, and finally, it may benefit the lipid or your cholesterol profile. So vitamin C plays a much more interesting, much more complex role in our body and in, in our, our human structure than many of us even realize. It's a very important ingredient. It's something we desperately need. Now, if you eat a well-balanced diet, Chances are you get all the vitamin C you need. If there's anything I've learned over the past 30 years almost of LGBT affirming ministry and the ministry that God has brought me into in the last 30 years, if there's anything I've learned, it is how important a balanced spiritual diet is. 
I grew up in the Pentecostal movement. I love the Pentecostal faith. Like the old song says, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Honey, you couldn't turn me from this for all the money in the world. You couldn't turn me. I love this message. I love this way. It's worked for me. If it hadn't worked for you, I don't know what your problem is. It's worked for me and it's worked wonders. I'm fine with this good old-fashioned Holy Ghost baptized, tongue-talking, aisle-dancing way. But I will say this. Having grown up in the Pentecostal faith, especially having grown up in a fundamentalist, evangelical Pentecostal organization, uh, one of the most homophobic, as a matter of fact, according to the Human Rights Campaign, the church I grew up in is the most homophobic religious organization in America. Mm -hmm. And yet, I still love <laughs> my upbringing. I still appreciate everything. Were there things that were taught wrong? Were there things that were done wrong? Yes. But you know what? A lot of it was perfectly good, and I'm not about to throw away the baby with the bathwater. Too many people in our communities today, not only LGBT people, but even non-LGBT people, they get upset with certain aspects of the church or certain aspects of the message and that they're hearing. And they throw the baby out with the bathwater. They say, oh, well, none of it's good, honey. Uh, no, 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 no. You've got to be more discerning with that because when you stand before God in the judgment, if you think the Lord is going to say, uh, yeah, okay, I'll accept the fact that you threw it all away for the sake of these few things that you had trouble with and that you disagree with and that you believe were not in keeping with my standard and with my uh, proper biblical interpretation. If you think God's going to be okay with all that, you know, uh, just throw 90% of it away because 10% of it was bad. I've got news for you, honey. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. But if there's anything I learned from growing up in a fundamentalist evangelical church, it is that the diet that is fed God's people scripturally is so out of whack and so out of balance it isn't even funny. 90% of what you hear in many churches is if it isn't condemnation and accusing the other guy and putting the other guy down, then it's cheerleading. It's about stirring emotion and getting people excited and getting people, you know, uh, uplifted. That's all well and good. And there are times when that is perfectly necessary. And I've got news for you. When it's necessary, that's the kind of message God gives this preacher. But then there are times when you can't just eat the candy. Right. You can't just chew on the steak. There are times when you need the potatoes. There are times when you need the broccoli, the cauliflower, the spinach, the Brussels sprouts, the liver and onions. Some of y'all are thinking, oh dear God, he had to go there. Liver and onions. Personally, I love me some liver and onions. But there are times when our diet requires... If we're to have a balanced diet, if we're to get all the nutrients and the minerals and the vitamins that our body needs to properly function, we've got to have a balanced diet. And if you notice, Pastor Charles, I, one Sunday you come and I'll preach a message in one vein, and the next Sunday you come and I preach a message in a vein completely different mm -hmm. than the vein I preached in last Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's because I preach what God gives me. I'm not because I sit around trying to find something pretty to preach. I don't sit around and reason in my head, what should I tell the people? No, no, no. I ask God, literally, Lord, what do you want to tell the people? Share with me. Let me know. And there are times when God will inspire three or four messages in me over the course of a week's time. And I'll be writing notes 
I'm all for these messages. But then I've got to go to the Lord and say, Lord, which message today? The Bible said a word fitly spoken is as apples of gold. When the right word comes at the right time, it holds great value. Mm -hmm, right. But the right word at the wrong time is worthless. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I don't need vitamin C when I have all the vitamin C that I need. Hello now. Our bodies tend to crave that which we need. That which is necessary. That which we're lacking. I remember back in 2000 when I was going through uh, the issue with the parasite in my intestine I was craving oh I was craving anything that had tomatoes in it and I craved it so badly I would ask my best friend Jose who was staying with me at the time I'd say Jose would you please do me a favor we had a blimpies uh, down on, on the street beneath where my apartment was. I'd say, would you please do me a favor? Could you go down to Blimpies and just ask them if you could please buy a tomato or two? I didn't want a sandwich. I just wanted a tomato or two. And I mean, I was craving it so bad, my God. And then after a while, I had to see the doctor. I went to the doctor. They did some blood work. I came home. And after a few hours, my doctor called me and said, Charles, I need you to call an ambulance. I need you in the hospital immediately. And I said, well, my Lord, why? He said, your test results came back and your potassium level is so dangerously low. He said, your potassium level is so dangerously low. Potassium is what regulates your heart and your heartbeat. He said, your heart is all over the place right now. He said, you could literally have a massive heart attack at any second. He said, I literally need you by ambulance to be carried to the hospital as fast as you can get here. Your potassium level is so low. So I went to the hospital, they put the potassium in by IV. If you've never had potassium by IV, it burns, it stings, it hurts. Makes your arm feel like it's on fire, literally. My whole arm just felt like it was a blaze. It burned and burned. And they told me before they put it in that it was going to have this sensation, you know. Oh, I'm going to tell you, it's a whole lot better if you can get it through your diet. I found out why my body was craving tomatoes and why I was craving anything, tomato sauce, any spaghetti sauce. I was craving anything in the world that had tomatoes in it. And the doctor said, that's because your body was screaming for potassium. And tomatoes are high, high in potassium. But see now, if you have the right diet, then you don't need the occasional IV. And if you have to take the IV, you're going to wish that you had taken the proper amount of potassium by reason of your diet. There are times we go to church and the Lord has to give us a good kick in the backside. And we wind up leaving the house of God with our bum hurting. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't know why the pastor had to go there like that. I don't know why he had to say it like that. Well, I'll tell you why. Because that's how he was anointed and that's how he was directed of the Holy Ghost to go. And you didn't want to eat your, your potassium. So God had to give you an IV and the IV burns. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Vitamin C is essential to our health. It is essential to our longevity. Vitamin C for the believer is something that far too many believers today are lacking. And vitamin C is described for the church today, listen to me children, as compassion. We read our primary text today and most people, if you ask them, what subject matter does this text cover? And most people will answer without even giving it a thought. Oh, it's a passage about forgiveness. 
But no, it's a passage about far more than forgiveness because the forgiveness wouldn't have come if something else hadn't been present first. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? If you read the story, if you read the passage that I've read to you today, in verse 26 it says, The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Verse 27. Then the Lord of that servant, listen, was moved with compassion mm -hmm. and loosed him and forgave him the debt. And then when the servant goes out and finds someone else who owes them far less than he owed the king, and he throttles them by the neck demanding repayment and the man's not able to pay, and he asks for compassion. The servant can't find compassion. And he throws the man in jail until he gets his money. Till his family is somehow able to scrape up the money to repay his debt so that the man can be released from prison. And when he's called back before the king, listen to what the king had to say. Verse 32, Then his lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest thou, excuse me, I always put the thou in front of the not. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. You see, the forgiveness issue wouldn't even come up in this conversation if the compassion weren't first there. Am I telling the truth? The king had compassion on the servant, so he forgave him. Then when the king calls the man back in, he said, you weren't willing to show this man any pity. You weren't willing to show this man what? Any compassion. The forgiveness is an act of compassion. So if this story, if this text has to do with any subject, it has far more to do with compassion than it does forgiveness. Are you hearing me today? Compassion gives birth to many things. Compassion gives birth to love in action, which is how you describe the word charity. Charity, as you find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, is not an issue of love as a fluttery heart emotion that you feel for that one you find attractive and sweet and kind and appealing to you. No, that's not the love that's described in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 speaks of love in action. Love that gives birth to action. That's what we call charity. Charities are organizations that demonstrate love through their actions. But what must first give birth to that charity? Compassion. Charities are born of compassion. Why do I belong to one political party over another political party? A party that I first belonged to when I registered as a young man uh, first to vote. And for many years I was part of this other party. And, and then finally I came to the place where I said, I can't do this anymore. I can't be part of this group anymore. I can't identify with these people anymore. Why? I'll tell you why. Because one party identifies with greed and selfishness and self-servantness mm -hmm. and the other party identifies with compassion yes you can come up with everything you want to come up with you can try to label Democrats every kind of way you want to label I'm sorry I don't preach politics but I'm gonna say it plain because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying you can try to demonize and say everything negative and nasty you want about Democrats all you want to but the Democratic platform is a platform that is based in compassion we have compassion on those who are seeking refuge refuge 
refugees. We have compassion on those who desire to become part of our nation and, and immigrants who want to become part of the American dream, who want to experience the freedoms and the opportunities that America affords them. We have compassion on the poor. We have compassion on the sick. We have compassion on those parents who are trying to work to, to uh, take care of their families, but the mother's entire income is swallowed up in child care. We have compassion on people who are trying to better themselves and to pursue a better life by seeking after a higher education. Am I telling the truth today? I know I am. Because I saw this with my own eyes over the course of a couple of decades. And I decided, you know what, I cannot identify any longer with this party over here that says, screw you, you take care of yourself, you do for yourself. If you can't do for yourself, as one Republican lawyer said in the Uber I was driving one day, if you hadn't been able to get a good job with good benefits, so you've got good health care, and you wind up in the hospital sick, and you don't have the insurance to take care of yourself, well then you just need to die. That's what this man literally said to me in my, cat, in my car. Mm. I wanted to stop my car on the side of the road and tell that giant jackal to get out and walk. That's what I wanted to do. But that is the mentality of this group over here. Hey, I did it, so you can do it. No, 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 no. No, honey. Uh-uh. You didn't grow up the way I grew up. Right. You don't live every day of your life with the same impediments that I deal with. You don't have to wrestle the same demons I have to wrestle with. Let me tell you, there are people today who can't go to college and can't be successful in college, and it's not because they don't have the intellect. It's not even because they don't have access to the funding. But Tommy, they have been so abused and so mentally mistreated that for the life of them, they keep failing because they just cannot stay motivated, they cannot stay encouraged, they get depressed easily, they get discouraged easily. Why? Because their entire youth they were discouraged and they were told how worthless they were and how no good they were and how they never amount to anything. How do I know this? Because I've been there. That's the kind of garbage that my father preached into his three sons' heads every day of their lives, relentlessly, without even a moment's respite. That man stayed on message 24-7 every day of the year, every single day. I have not had anything to do, frankly, with my father and Lord have mercy. It's been over 30 years. For my own mental health and my own well-being, I had to just drop him and leave him alone. Say, he, need, he needs to deal with himself because every time I was anywhere near him, literally, folks, I would leave his presence a basket case. I have two brothers. One of them has come to the same identical conclusion that I've come to. He finally realized, took him a lot longer than me, but he finally realized, I can't do this. I can't do it. This man is toxic. He is dangerous. He's poisonous. He so poisons your mind. He had a great deal to do with why my youngest brother went to Iraq to fight for the United States of America and the Iraq war after 9-11. My brother came home damaged. He came home, I almost want to say irreparably damaged, but I know that God is able to heal and to help. All because he was trying to prove himself to a man who was going to turn around and just lay it on him when he got home. Let him know that 
His service didn't mean jack squat and that it didn't prove nothing. And blah, 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 blah. So for all he went through and all he put himself through, for everything that he has to live with now for the rest of his life, all that garbage was brought into his life because of the input of this one man. By the way, Mr. Republican, Mrs. Republican, don't give me your crap about how imperative and how important it is that a child have a mother and a father in their home. That is garbage. That is insanity. That is foolishness. You can throw that crap out because I'm too smart to buy into that foolishness. I'd rather have had two mothers that loved me and supported me and encouraged me. I'd rather have had two fathers that loved me and encouraged me and supported me. I grew up, everybody around me's parents were divorced. Most of the kids I went to school with, their parents were divorced. I was one of the few who had parents who were still married. God had to give anything to have been one of those other kids. My father not only abused his children miserably, he abused his wife miserably. My mother, I remember a time when I was young, when my mother was a young, energetic, smiling, happy mother. By the time I was five, her demeanor changed. She lost her joy. She was angry. She was frustrated. I'm not going to go much further than that. But I want to tell you today, people, don't give me this foolishness about these idiotic and asinine ideals that are based in a reality that does not exist. Years ago, if a young woman became pregnant out of wedlock, why it was expected that the young man who impregnated her would marry her to quote-unquote make things right. Sweetheart, I dare say that many of those marriages that ended, excuse me, that began trying to quote-unquote make things right, many of those marriages were in fact doing the exact opposite, and they were, they were <laughs> doing exactly the wrong thing. Because the fella who got that girl pregnant is the last guy in the world she needs to be hooked with for life. Her children's mental health, their psychology, their well-being would be better served if she raised that child alone and struggled as a single mother. Or if she raised that child at home with her parents. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, oh, preacher, you're not supposed to say that. I got apostolic folks watching me now. And boy, they're just bubbling and bursting. How dare he say that? Listen, you idiot. I'm speaking the truth whether you like it or not. I'm here to tell you today, the reason I'm a Democrat, not a Republican, is because I believe in compassion. I don't believe that religion has a place in government, but I believe compassion does. Because compassion is not about religion. Hello now. That's right. But compassion is something that no Christian should even attempt to live without. And yet there are innumerable Christian people who live their lives every day, listen to me, completely and totally devoid of compassion. Got news for you, honey. God has been kind enough to you to have compassion on you. Every day of your life, the Lord overlooks faults. He overlooks sin. He mm -hmm. overlooks weakness in your life. And He shows you mercy. Because we serve a God today who is a God of compassion. 
In Psalm 78 and verse 38, the word of the Lord says, But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity, and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away, and did not stir up all his wrath. In Psalm 85, verse, excuse me, 86, verse 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. In Psalm 111, verse 4, He hath made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. In Psalm 112, verse 4, Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. In Psalm 145, and verse 8, the word of the Lord declares, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The primary motivation in the New Testament for many of the Lord Jesus Christ's miracles was compassion. Matthew 9, 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd, the feeding of the 5,000 with loaves of bread and fish. Matthew 14, 14, And Jesus sent forth, went forth, and saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Matthew 15, 32, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days, and have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. Matthew 20, 34. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Mark chapter 1, verse 41. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. Mark 5, verse 19, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. Mark 6, 34, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Mark 8 and 2, I have compassion on the multitude, Jesus said, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. This is, again, the same telling from different Gospels of the account of the feeding of the 5,000. Mark 9, 22, a man comes to Jesus and describes his son to him, saying, and oft times, it, speaking of the boy being demon-possessed, he said, and oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And those of us who know the story knows Jesus helped him, didn't he? Luke 7, verse 13, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. I'm here to tell you that Old Testament God 
in spite of what many people try to tell you, how they try to characterize the God of the Old Testament, He was in fact a God of great compassion. The New Testament God is the same God of the Old Testament, but we see Him in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And i got news for you today, children. Jesus is compassionate. His miracles were born of compassion. Why do we not see miracles and healings occurring in the Pentecostal church today as we did just 30 and 40 and 50 years ago? Why are we not seeing things we used to see? It's easy. It's very easy. Because the word Christian does not mean somebody who believes in Jesus. The word Christian does not mean somebody who follows the teachings of Christ. The word Christian is not someone who identifies as a follower of Jesus. All of those are false definitions of the word Christian. The word Christian as it was used in the New Testament, as it was applied to believers... Believers didn't call themselves Christians. Observers called them Christians. Got news for you. A lot of so-called Christians in the world today, if they were waiting for observers to label them a Christian, they'd be waiting a long time. Observers are too busy uh, labeling them selfish and greedy, labeling them as evil and wicked. Hello now. Labeling them as ungodly and unholy. Labeling them as angry and malicious. Come on now. Yeah. Fearful and anxious. That's the label most so-called Christians today would wear. But in the New Testament, when they were first called Christians by observers, the word Christian literally means one who looks like Christ. The reason they labeled them Christians is because the early believers literally resembled Jesus, not only in their attitudes, not only in their actions, but they were performing miracles, they were casting out demons, they were doing the same things Jesus did. So the early church was a bunch of mini Jesuses running around. And that's why observers called them Christians. These people are mini Jesuses. These people are Jesus lookalikes. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? I've got news for you, honey. You you cannot be a Christian without vitamin C. You cannot be a Christian without compassion. Amen. Compassion played an important role in almost everything Jesus did for people. But we have churches today that spend more time justifying their creed, justifying their selfishness, yep. justifying their self-servantness, justifying their worldliness, yep. justifying their carnality because they don't want to acknowledge that they are vitamin C deficient. Mm -hmm. You know, Mother Teresa, I don't quote a lot of Catholic figures, but Mother Teresa, bless her heart, in India, has a famous quote. She said, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. Let me ask you a question today. If you were the victim of a violent crime, would you want the jury in the trial against your attacker to be comprised of his friends and family? People who love him? No. No, probably not. Your chances of getting an impartial or a just judgment would be slim if the jury were so comprised, wouldn't it? Why? Because those people would all understand this person's background. They would know things about where this person came from. They would know things about what this person experienced. Well, bless his heart, but he, he grew up in an awful abusive environment. His father used to beat him. His mother used to abuse him, you know. And, and they would have all kinds of understanding, and their love for him would give birth to what? Compassion. And you probably wouldn't get the judgment you'd like to get. You wouldn't get justice, that's for certain. Because it's comprised, the jury's comprised of people who have compassion on 
the perpetrator of the crime. Oh, I want to tell you, Mother Teresa said, if you love people, when you love people, you, 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 if you judge people, you have no time to love them. You can only do one or the other. You cannot do both. Mm -hmm. You cannot judge fair judgment and love them at the same time. Am I telling the truth? No. Because love automatically makes you want to show partiality. I remember when I was a kid growing up in New England, uh, one time my brother and I were downtown, the little town we grew up in. We only had one stoplight in our town, and it was at the very bottom of the street that we lived on, the road we lived on. And we were about a mile up the road from this stoplight, and we used to ride our bikes to go to baseball practice and things like that. And we were on our bikes for whatever reason, and we were downtown at the main intersection, and all of a sudden this car went through a red light, and she got T-boned by another car, and we saw the accident happen, and we knew what happened. And boy, we were sitting there talking amongst ourselves. Boy, I'll tell you what, that... That person who drove through that light sure was at fault, blah, 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 blah. Well, after a few minutes, the person driving that car got out of her car, and she's walking around, and we looked, and we recognized her. And guess what? She was one of the girls from our church. A pretty little thing that we all knew. All of a sudden, our perception of that accident changed in a split second. You hear what I'm telling you now? All of a sudden, we weren't so sure that the light was red. All of a sudden, we weren't so sure that that guy shouldn't have been traveling so fast and going as quickly as he was, because if he wasn't speeding, then he wouldn't have hit her anyhow. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Isn't it funny how love changes our perception. Isn't it funny how love gives birth to compassion and compassion in turn can change how we saw how we see things. Oh, but Christians today, they can look at people and they can judge people and they can condemn people and they have no interest in the world in compassion. And yet the Word of God declares in 1 John 4, 20, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? 1 John 3 and 10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Whosoever, 1 John 3, 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. My goodness. The Word of God tells us. The Word of God tells us you can't possibly be a Christian and not have love. You can't possibly have love and not exercise compassion. When you eat the orange, you get the vitamin C. Hello now. Mm -hmm. When you have love, then you've got the vitamin C. You've got the compassion. You can't have love without compassion. Hello now. And if you're compassionless, it is because, my friend, you're struggling with lovelessness. And you cannot show compassion. You need to pray that God will fill your heart with love because that is where compassion is born, in a loving heart. The Word of God declares... 1 John 3, 14 through 18. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Who did? 
Hereby we perceive the love of God, because He, pronoun that follows the noun, who does the pronoun speak of? The noun. God, because God laid down His life. Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. But whoso, whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth, meaning charity. Let us demonstrate our love by reason of our actions. If you have what you need, and you see a brother or sister, or anyone for that matter, your neighbor in need, and you are able to shut up your bowels of compassion, then the writer says, how in the world does the love of God abide in you? How can you claim to have the love of God in you? Tommy can tell you, I have an awful hard time when I see somebody that has a need. If, if there's any way in the universe I can try to help them, if there's any way in the world I can try to meet that need, I'm inclined to do so, am I not? Mm -hmm. Man, I'm telling you, it, it, I wish to God I were a billionaire. Not because I'd live large and have a mansion and a yacht, but because I love being able to contribute to helping people and to help meet needs. Uh, that, that's, there's something in that that I find so rewarding and I'm so grateful for. But there are so-called Christians today. They belong to one one party over another in the political realm because that party tells them, you know what, if that person has need, then let them go out and get a job. Let them go out and do this. Let them go out and do that. Ignore the fact they may have impediments. And ignore the fact that they may have obstacles in their way. You know, we look at people sometimes and we want to label them as lazy. I've learned a long time ago learned a long time ago. You better be careful about who, who you label as lazy. Mm -hmm. Some of those people may be struggling with depression that you have never had to face a day in your life. How do I know? I've been there. I've experienced clinical depression. I know what it feels like to be so depressed you can't hardly lift your head off the pillow to get up out of your bed. Oh, I want to tell you folks, it's debilitating. It's horrible. Many of you watching today, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been through depression. You've been so despondent. You've been so down that you couldn't hardly function. You couldn't hardly move. Growing up as a kid, I used to lay in my bed. Literally. I used to lay in my bed. My house was so full of negativity and, and demons. There's so much arguing and nastiness being flown about. And if I was in the room, a lot of times I was being called names and ridiculed and mocked by my father, not by a stranger, not by my sibling, by my father. Of course, luckily my brother would enjoy it, so he'd get in on it and laugh and think it was funny. So I had the two of them laughing at me. There were days, Tommy, I lay in my bed. All I ever wanted my whole life growing up as a kid was somebody to love me. So you had a mother, you had a dad, you had brothers, yeah, and I'd give anything in the universe to have had somebody that I knew for a fact loved me. Because one minute I'd hear from some members of my family, I love you, and the next minute I'd hear, I'm not even going to tell you what I'd hear, but some of the nastiest language that was ever invented in, in, the, in the English language, and then I'd be told, I hate you, I wish you were never born. Yeah, I went through that growing up. I lay in my bed, and I'd pray, and I'd say, Jesus, Lord, please 
Just take me home tonight, Lord. You know, there used to be a little children's prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And I'd sit there in my bed. I'd say, Lord, not if I should die, but you'd be doing me a favor. I'd, I'd be so grateful, God, if you would just take. I was never, as a young person, I was never suicidal. I never had a thought to take my own life. But I would ask God to do it for me. I asked the Lord, please, Lord, don't let me wake up tomorrow morning. I'd go to school, and I had kids on the school bus bullying me, calling me faggot, calling me queer, calling me sissy. I had a nervous condition that was so bad that some people thought I had Tourette's syndrome, if you know what Tourette's syndrome is. For eight years of my life, from the time I was eight years old till I was 16, I had a nervous condition that caused facial, involuntary facial tics, and my head would bob, and I, I can't even do it. I literally cannot even demonstrate to you what I did, because it was involuntary, and I, I can't do it. <clears throat> Man, I got picked on miserably in school. And the whole time, I was trying my best to believe this gospel. The whole time I was trying my best to prepare myself for ministry because God called me to preach when I was eight. You say, well, isn't that funny? That's the same time your tick started. Yeah. It's also the same time that my father went into hyper mode as if Satan himself informed him that God had called me to preach. And now he wanted my father to go into light speed and destroy me psychologically, emotionally. I've got a brother now who is trying to act like an atheist, the one who's been through war. And he'll try every once in a while to say things that are anti-God and anti-church and anti-faith to me. And During my last visit with him, I told him, I said, let me tell you a little secret. <laughs> let me tell you a little secret. I grew up with the same crap coming off of your lips being thrown at me every day by Dad. And I didn't like it then, and I don't like it now, and if you think you're throwing it at me, it's going to accomplish something, and all of a sudden I'm going to wake up and say, oh yeah, hey, I decided I want to be an atheist. I said, sweetheart, you couldn't be more wrong. Said, and furthermore, it was my faith that kept me sane when I was going through it as a kid. So you can discount my faith all you want to, but that faith is what kept me and secured me when I was young. And my brother, my brother, knowing, <laughs> knowing what we've been through, said, I get that. You know what cracks me up, Tommy, is I've got family members, aunts and uncles, grandparents. All my grandparents are dead now. But especially on my mother's side of the family, because that was the quote-unquote Christian side of my family. They were all fundamentalist evangelicals. Boy, I mean, just as ardent fundamentalists as you can get. When I came out, 1989, I had several of them who from that day till this have been nothing but hateful and nasty and mean-spirited and malicious to me. And you know what makes me laugh? There isn't a one of them that didn't watch and see what I grew up with. There isn't a one of them that wasn't there to see me take a beating. There wasn't a one of them that wasn't there when I had loved ones telling me that they wished I'd have never been born. There wasn't a one of them that wasn't there when they saw my father belittling and putting me down, uh, and my brothers, and my mother. And not a one of them ever had enough guts or strength of character to stand up for any one of us. And yet, when I come out in 1989, these same people think nothing 
nothing of just heaping more abuse and more negativity and more hatred. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I'm here to tell you. Folks, don't tell me you're a Christian because you're full of crap. Yeah, I use the word. You need a good old-fashioned spiritual enema because, honey, you are full of baloney. You are no more a Christian than Satan is an archangel. I know a girl I grew up with in church. It was known, I've told this story before, it was known that her dad was involved in abusing her sexually for years. Now, he, this family did not attend our church regularly over the course of years. They would kind of come and go, you know, they'd come for a year and then they'd kind of go somewhere else. Or do, and I'm, I'm not sure it wasn't because this guy was trying to keep his activities, you know, from becoming known. But somewhere along the line, this girl told an aunt of mine what was happening. This young lady grew up, and as an adult, she came out as lesbian. And the same aunt, the same aunt that she shared her secret with, the same aunt that she confided in concerning her being raped and molested by her own father for years, tore into her and let her know she had chosen wickedness over God. She had chosen an evil lifestyle and that she was unholy and blah, 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 blah. Honey, you have a vitamin C deficiency. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to agree with who I am. You don't have to agree with her. You don't have to agree with her choices. You don't have to agree with with uh, what she now today identifies as. You don't have to agree with none of if you don't want to. I'm not asking you. I'm not trying to force people into agreeing with anything. But what I am telling you is as a child of God, you have got to demonstrate compassion. Knowing what that girl had been through, I don't give a flying fig how much you disagree with it. You should have said to her, Honey, you've always been my sister. You'll always be my sister. I loved you yesterday. I'll love you tomorrow. Whatever choices you make, whatever direction you go in, I'm a child of God and I am full of nothing but love for you. Am I telling the truth? That is what should have come out of her lips. Not judgment, not condemnation, not ridicule, not abuse. Did her words minister healing to this girl? I doubt it. Did her words encourage this girl to abandon her homosexuality and come back to the church? I doubt it. That's my job. That's what I preach. Trying to help those same people who have been abused and who have been mistreated and who have been ostracized and who have been pushed out of the church by jackals with hateful mouths and hearts lacking love and compassion. You know, one thing I learned when I came out, and I've told people this many times when they are wrestling with coming out, struggling with coming out, I'm going to tell you my experience. I, I can't tell you everybody's. I can tell you mine. The people who loved me before I came out loved me after I came out. Honestly. I had a number of aunts and uncles that while they may not have understood, they may not have agreed, they may not have condoned, if you want to call it that, they continued to love me unconditionally. That one aunt I told you about, that girl and I had been at odds with each other ever since we were I was a baby. She was second from the youngest in a family of ten, my mother being the oldest. I was the first grandchild born into the family. Guess what? Little Chucky took some of the attention away 
and some of the affection away from grandma and grandpa that this little girl is the baby girl of the family was getting. You follow? You know how it works when a grandbaby's born. You know, it's not that mom and dad love them more, or, you know, or love you any less. But all of a sudden, they give attention to the grandbaby, and they're excited about the grandbaby. And that little girl, I'm going to tell you something, she was about six years or so older than me. And man, I'm here to tell you, she hated me literally from the day I was born. That girl hated me. And all growing up my entire life, Tommy, all I ever got from her was abuse and negativity and, ne and nastiness. So when she reacted to my coming out the way she did, it was no surprise. That's how she reacted to me before I come out. You follow what I'm telling you now? But I'm here to tell you today, the people that loved you, my grandfather loved me before I come out. And you want to know something? My grandfather, who I, I used to watch as a kid, I'd watch him say things. I'll never forget one time, those of you old enough to remember, will remember the Phil Donahue. He was the Oprah Winfrey of the 70s, you know. And Phil Donahue was on TV, I'll never forget it, and he was interviewing a couple of gay men. They were both muscular and good-looking guys, you know, very stereotypical to be frank, as far as, you know, being all muscle and, you know. And he was interviewing them, and this is way before any conversation about homosexuality was really encroached upon on television or anywhere else. And Phil Donahue broke a lot of ground. And I watched that show because even then I was struggling with identity issues, but you know, but I, I was keeping it suppressed. I was not doing anything about it, you know. But I watched that show, and, and I mean, I just watched and ate up every word they said. I wanted to understand them. I wanted, you know, I hear somebody else that feels what I'm feeling, and I don't get it, so maybe they can help me understand it. And then my grandfather come out with it. One of my kids or grandkids told me they were a blankety blank faggot. I blankety blank 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 blank. And man, he scared the life out of me. I knew in 89 when I finally made the decision, I just can't, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't play this game. I can't. I'm so lonely. I'm so depressed. I'm struggling like crazy. All because I'm trying to deny a part of me that I have no more control over than the color of my eyes. When I came out in 89, I just knew my grandfather I'd heard him say years before, I'd heard him say what he'd do if. And I just knew he probably was going to disown me and stop talking to me and have nothing to do with me. And you want to know what my grandfather did? <laughs> he loved the fire out of me. He loved me before I came out. He never changed one lick. He never changed one single lick. He didn't say nasty things to me about it. He didn't call me names. He didn't criticize my friends. He didn't say, no, my grandmother, his wife did all that. <laughs> and he'd shake his head like this as she was saying it. He'd be so disgusted with her and her wisdomless, loveless, compassionless mouth. Yeah, I grew up in a fundamentalist family where love was as conditional as love can get. But my grandfather put no conditions on his love. About maybe a year or so before he died, one day, we, my, my former partner and I used to go home to Connecticut to visit, and my grandfather made the bed in the guest room for us to share. He used to go up there and turn on the electric blanket for us because uh, there, my grandparents' house was an old house. And boy, I mean to tell you, the heat didn't work very well downstairs, never mind upstairs. And you, you could hardly ever feel heat upstairs, you know. So if you were going to be warm, you had to use an electric blanket. And my grandfather would go up and he'd turn that blanket on and he'd, He'd tell me after a while, he'd say, I went upstairs and turned the electric blanket on so y'all don't have to be cold tonight, you know. That was my grandfather, the same guy who come out with, if my blanket ain't working, 
But I'm here to tell you, if they loved you before, they're going to love you after. I don't care what's come out of their mouth. I don't care what they've said. When it was all conjecture, when it was all if, when the reality comes, you'd be surprised. And one day my grandfather and I were upstairs in the bedroom. He was, he'd come up to do something and, and he said, you know, he said, let's sit down for a minute. So we sat down and, and Grandpa and I never did this. this. This was very out of character for him. And he just said to me, he said, you know, and I could tell, man, he was struggling. He was struggling for every word. He said, I just want to say, make sure you're ready. Just be ready. When the end comes and this life is over, he said, just be ready. That's all he said. And I told him, I said, don't you worry, Grandpa. I said, I'm going to be ready. I'll be ready when Jesus comes. For all his faults, for all his weaknesses, for all his temper and his temperament, that man had an incredible capacity for love and an incredible capacity for compassion. I dare say that man was more Christian than most so-called Christians are today. Because the reality is, we have to have vitamin C. Well, many preachers today aren't preaching compassion, are they? They preach judgment. They preach condemnation. They preach ridicule. They preach bitterness and negativity. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. Almost finished. I know I'm going over time, folks, but I can't help it. I'm sorry. We know that, excuse me, 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and seek good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. That doesn't mean you hate evil in other people. That means that you hate to do evil, that you hate evil so much that you do everything in your power not to partake of it and not to carry it out and to do it in your own life. Let him eschew evil. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil and lastly this afternoon Hebrews 5 1 through 3 for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. What is the Apostle Paul telling the Hebrew church? He's saying the high priest is also a human being. And as such, he said, he is able to feel compassion for his fellow man as he makes sacrifices on behalf of others as well as himself. He's talking about the high priest. We got Christians in the church. 
they don't even understand. You're a sinner saved by grace, honey. And if you're a sinner saved by grace, then you ought to be able to have compassion on sinners as well as saints. Hello now. Right. Because you know you're no more perfect than they are. Your sin, your struggles, your weaknesses may be in different areas than theirs, but they're there nonetheless. We fail to exercise compassion when we forget that we too are human and in need of grace every bit as much as anyone, mm -hmm. anyone of whom we might decide to sit in compassionless judgment. In the story of the great of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, meaning the man who had been beaten and left beside the road to die. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. In the end, compassion is the vitamin C for believers. In that, it is an ingredient essential to our own health and survival. It helps us both to function well and to ward off disease. No Christian can live a godly, graceful life without a healthy dose of vitamin C. Amen. And that vitamin C is compassion. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Mm -hmm.